Hey guys, Tyler here. The temporal cold war first introduced in Star Trek Enterprise is a conflict fought between various factions wishing to manipulate the timeline for their own benefit. Much of what we learn about the temporal cold war comes from Daniels, a mysterious temporal agent from the 31st century who recruits Jonathan Archer, captain of the NX-01 Enterprise 900 years prior, for various missions to save history. But the history that Daniels is defending is different from the one that we see unfold on screen. That is, numerous events that are seminal to Star Trek's so-called Prime Universe were never supposed to happen, at least if we take Daniels at his word. But what would the Star Trek timeline look like with less interference from the future? In this video, I'd like to examine the impact that the temporal Cold War has has had on the chronology of Star Trek's prime timeline. But before we begin, a word from today's sponsor, Star Trek Timelines. Star Trek Timelines is the ultimate Star Trek strategy RPG. This interactive mobile game is free to play and available on all devices. Download it by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code now and claim special rewards. Join to save the galaxy from temporal anomalies and enjoy action-packed 3D ship battles. You'll find all your favorite characters, Spock, Kirk, Picard, Pike, Mariner, Janeway, Burnham, and more. Collect them all to assemble the best Starfleet crew. Become a captain, take command of your starship, and explore deep space. Complete missions and ship battles to level up and collect captain rewards. Warp to new destinations, receive distress calls, and aim to bring order to this chaos by assembling your crew and sending them on missions. Command iconic starships like the USS Enterprise and Voyager. Take part in legendary PvE and PvP battles that will put your captain skills to the test. Unlock new characters and rewards by completing daily missions and participating in campaigns featured daily in the event hub. Gain XP to influence factions, rank up in the leaderboards, and unlock special events and rewards. Invite your friends and create or join a fleet to share bonuses. This week, Star Trek Timelines is running a challenge and giving five extra-large Enterprise NCC-1701 Starship models to five new players who reach and unlock Captain Level 5 before August 3rd. Download the game by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code. Let's get started. The first major deviation that we see on screen is in the pilot of Enterprise, Broken Bow. It involves members of the Suliban Cabal, an interstellar terrorist organization active in the 22nd century. The Suliban's homeworld had been rendered uninhabitable 300 years earlier, forcing the species to become nomadic. The Cabal takes orders from a mysterious humanoid figure native to the 28th century. This future benefactor's identity is never revealed. As payment for their services, the benefactor provides members of the Cabal with technical expertise to perform genetic augmentations on themselves, including giving themselves enhanced senses, the ability to shapeshift, and the ability to withstand extreme environmental conditions. He also provides them with technology like cloaking devices. The Cabal opposes various other factions in the Temporal Cold War, including the Tholians, the Sphere Builders, the Tandarans, the Nakul, and evidently the United Federation of Planets. In Broken Bow, we learn that members of the Cabal have been covertly staging attacks between various Klingon houses in an attempt to spark a civil war. The plot is uncovered when Saren, a former Cabal member, provides Klang, a Klingon courier, with relevant information. The crew of the NX-01 is tasked with returning Klang to the Klingon homeworld, Kronos, after he accidentally crash lands on Earth in Broken Bow, Oklahoma, which, by the way, is a real town. The whole ordeal marks first contact between humans and Klingons, as well as presumably between Earth and the Suliban, possibly years, if not decades, earlier than it otherwise would have occurred. Notably, a line of dialogue in the Next Generation episode, First Contact, 
references a long, bloody war between the Federation and Klingon Empire in the aftermath of a botched first contact, something we never see in Enterprise. A similar war in the late 2250s is, however, depicted in Season 1 of Star Trek Discovery. Ultimately, it's possible that the depiction of alternate human-Klingon relations in Enterprise, a century before Discovery, does indeed constitute a retcon. This arguably opens up a whole can of worms that the writers of current Trek are not shying away at all from opening, it seems, as it means the new shows could actually take place in an alternate prime universe than the one that for example, the original series took place in. If true, this would arguably give credence to some of the arguments of the show's biggest critics, while paradoxically also rendering those arguments moot. For example, regarding visual differences between Trek produced in the 60s and 70s and Trek produced today. Indeed, the writers of Star Trek Strange New Worlds have confirmed that the temporal Cold War might have had some lingering effects that include for example, shifting the dates of the eugenics wars. As a matter of fact, I have a whole video cataloging what I consider to be five of the biggest retcons in Star Trek. Link in the description. This isn't the only time that the Suliban Cabal has interfered with Earth history, however. A year later, in 2152, the Cabal attempts to frame the Enterprise in X01 for the destruction of a mining colony on the planet Paragon 2. In the episode Shockwave, the Cabal, using an Enterprise shuttle pod, ignites the flammable tetrazine in Paragon 2's atmosphere. The resulting explosion destroys the mining colony and kills all of the Paragon colonists on the planet. The NX-01 crew is eventually able to prove their innocence with some assistance from Daniels. This might sound like nothing ultimately changes, but on the contrary, Daniels remarks that the destruction of the Paragon 2 mining colony was quote-unquote never supposed to happen, as it interfered with the Enterprise's mission. Over a century earlier, an even more severe deviation occurs that has reverberating effects on Earth's history for centuries to come. Following the conclusion of the Zindi Civil War around 2033, the Sphere Builders, a humanoid species from a transdimensional realm, make first contact with the Zindi. The Sphere Builders have the ability to observe various possible futures, and in one, they observe their defeat at the hands of the Federation in the 26th century, after the Sphere Builders attempt to invade normal space. To avoid this, the Sphere Builders present themselves to the Zindi as gods of sorts, and tell them that humanity will destroy the new Zindi homeworld in the 26th century. In the 26th century. In the, in the 26th century. In the 26th century. They guide the Zindi to construct a superweapon to destroy Earth, and the Zindi test a downscaled prototype of this weapon in 2153, killing 7 million people in the process. Ultimately, the Sphere Builder's plan to exterminate humanity is thwarted in the truth revealed by the crew of the NX-01. While Earth's future may have been saved, though, there are some other reverberating effects that stem from this conflict. First and foremost, there are the 7 million people who lost their lives when the Zindi tested their prototype, an attack which left a scar on Earth's surface stretching from Florida to Venezuela. Among the fallen is NX-01 chief engineer Trip Tucker's sister Elizabeth. Presumably she and the 7 million others did not die in an equivalent terrorist attack in the original timeline. One morbid truth that we must confront, however, is whether any of these 7 million people were important. A crass consideration, perhaps, but we're never told about any of the other knock-on effects from these 7 million people being removed from history. What we can gather, though, is that the Zindi conflict accelerated numerous identifiable developments 
within Starfleet. The integration of MAKOs, or Military Assault Command Operations, with Starfleet crews is spurred directly by the Zindi attack and Enterprise's impending mission into the Delphic Expanse, the region of space the Zindi inhabit. MAKO's technology and tactics are two to three years more advanced than Starfleet's, meaning that theoretically speaking, Starfleet technology is accelerated a quarter decade ahead of where it would have been in the original timeline. In any case, we do learn that after the founding of the United Federation of Planets in 2161, the MAKO organization is disbanded, and MAKO personnel are offered Starfleet commissions on a discretionary basis. From this point forward, Starfleet strives to distance itself from the perception of being a military organization, a disconcerting development for at least one former MAKO Starfleet captain, Balthazar Edison, as seen in the film Star Trek Beyond. Another technology whose use is accelerated by the Zindi conflict is in the realm of weapons technology, photonic torpedoes. Photonic torpedoes are equipped with variable yield antimatter warheads and can be launched while a ship is traveling at both warp and sublight speeds. They have over 50 times greater range than older Triton-class spatial torpedoes, which can also be more easily shot down due to their lower max speed. The variable yield of photonic torpedoes is described by Malcolm Reed as like knocking the comma ray off a shuttle pod without scratching the hull, or putting a three kilometer crater into an asteroid. Without the Zindi attack, it probably would have been a few more years before they were installed. As far as exploration goes, it's very likely that Starfleet would not have charted the interior of the Delphic Expanse as early as it had without the Zindi conflict. The Expanse itself is located 50 light years from Earth. It is nearly 2,000 light years across, riddled with a dangerous web of spatial anomalies, and surrounded by a thermobaric cloud layer, making navigation extremely hazardous. In some regions of the Expanse, the laws of of physics do not function reliably. Indeed, Star Trek.com has likened the Delphic Expanse to Earth's Bermuda Triangle. These spatial anomalies are generated by intense gravimetric distortion from the Sphere Builder's artificial sphere network. Each sphere is roughly 19 kilometers in diameter, and the purpose of the network is to transform the Expanse and beyond to more closely match the Sphere Builder's natural environment in prelude for their invasion of normal space. The Delphic Expanse ceases to exist as an astronomical phenomenon after the NX-01 crew destroys the Sphere Builder's network, and the properties of space within the region presumably return to normal. Regarding its size, if the figure of 2,000 light years across were remotely accurate, it presumably would not refer to a spherical diameter, as such a phenomenon would be a dominant feature within our galaxy. This means the expanse is probably a relatively flat region of space, perhaps somewhat oval-shaped and sitting askew relative to the galactic plane. As a matter of fact, stellar cartography, the Starfleet Reference Library, suggests the Delphic Expanse is located in the Beta Quadrant and is angled some 2,000 light years top to bottom within the 10,000 light year thickness of the Milky Way's galactic disk even though the disk is only 1,000 light years thick throughout most of the galaxy, including in our galactic neighborhood. But again, you know, it, it's sitting askew, probably. And as far as the various intelligent species native to the Expanse, including the Zindi, the Illyrians, and several others, presumably first contact with them would have occurred later in the original timeline. When it comes to political relationships, the Zindi conflict undoubtedly affected the buildup to the formation of the Federation. Cooperation between United Earth and the Andorian Empire is accelerated, as Andorian commander Thylek Shran renders assistance to the Enterprise on multiple occasions. In December of 2153, Shran's ship, the Kumari, provides tactical and engineering data 
to the Enterprise, helping her repair major damage incurred during an encounter with spatial anomalies. The Kamari also helps defend Earth against the Zindi in a second attack, giving the NX-01 crew time to destroy the Zindi superweapon. Shran does not hesitate to remind Archer that they are no longer even, and Archer owes him a favor, and Archer follows through on multiple occasions. Having waned prior to the Zindi attack in 2153, the extremist political group Terra Prime starts growing again in the wake of the conflict. They gain enough influence to cause concern among Earth leaders, and this concern is justified, as Terra Prime plans to carry out a terrorist attack of their own. Terra Prime leader John Frederick Paxton orders the creation of a human Vulcan binary clone, combining DNA from commanders Tucker and Paul, and Paxton plans to use the baby girl to rally the public behind his xenophobic views. He then hijacks the Verderon array on Mars, normally used to deflect collision course asteroids, and points it towards Earth, threatening to blow up Starfleet Command unless all aliens leave the system. The plot is, once again, thwarted by the NX-01 crew, and Paxton is taken into custody. Presumably, this sequence of events would not have unfolded without the Zindi Crisis, or maybe it would have, as Terra Prime were originally intended to be the main antagonists of Enterprise's first season, until Paramount ordered the creation of the Temporal Cold War. In any event, Terra Prime's efforts to isolate Earth from the rest of the galaxy ultimately fail. The Temporal Cold War temporarily turns hot when another faction, the Nakul, try to eliminate Earth as a threat by changing the past, but this interference is eventually undone. Following this victory, Daniels remarks that Archer has helped end the Temporal Cold War. And indeed, as we see in Season 3 of Star Trek Discovery, not too long after Daniel's final interaction with Archer, presumably sometime before the late 31st century, time travel technology is destroyed and outlawed. An amendment to the Temporal Accord, already in place by the 28th century, might have been drafted and ratified around this time. This updated accord would have prevented intervention from the future to stop the burn. And prior to this event, one could conceive of 31st century temporal agents scratching their heads as to why they weren't receiving visitors from the future. Although, to be fair, in the novels... Any, anyway, it, forget I said anything. As for who has the power to enforce such a new order, well, the Federation is probably the dominant power in the galaxy at this point, at 350 members strong, so they probably have some leeway when it comes to imposing their will on the cosmos. So, to recap, because of interference from various factions in the Temporal Cold War, the following things have probably been changed about the Star Trek timeline. First contact between Earth and multiple species has been accelerated, including the Klingons, Sulaban, Tholians, Sphere Builders, the Nakul, possibly the Tandarans, and several species native to the Delphic Expanse. The Tholians and Tandarans' involvement in the Temporal Cold War is harder to ascertain, but we see the Tandarans detain Suliban in camps, even those who are not members of the Cabal, for the Cabal's attempts to destabilize the Tandaran government. And the Tholians steal a 31st century Earth time ship, so they've got their own thing going on. The Paragon 2 mining colony is destroyed along with all of its inhabitants, an event history did not originally record. The fate of at least these Paragon's families, as well as those of the other aforementioned species, is irrevocably altered. The Zindi's history from the mid-21st century onward is altered as the Sphere Builders present themselves to the Zindi as gods. The Zindi develop a weapon that kills 7 million civilians on Earth who otherwise should not have died this early, 
including Trip Tucker's sister, Elizabeth. Makos are integrated into Starfleet crews earlier due to the Zindi Crisis. Starfleet begins using photonic torpedoes earlier. Starfleet explores the Delphic Expanse earlier than it originally would have and destroys the Sphere Network thwarting the Sphere Builder's attempts to invade the Milky Way. Cooperation between Earth and Andoria is accelerated ahead of the Romulan War. And finally, Terra Prime experiences a temporary resurgence in the wake of the Zindi Crisis. While the Temporal Cold War story arc appears to wrap up in the fourth season of Enterprise, it's likely we still would have seen further development of the storyline had Enterprise gotten more seasons. And when it comes to the broader implications of time travel on the Star Trek universe, well, that's a topic I might flesh out further in a future video. As for how the Enterprise writers might have dealt with some of the other apparent canon violations seen throughout the show, well, that's also a story for another time. So stay tuned for one or both of these videos down the road. I've honestly wanted to revisit the Temporal Cold War topic for years, and I'm glad I finally got to do it. If you've been following this channel for a long time, then you'll probably remember that I've made videos about the various factions involved in the Temporal Cold War, my attempt at a unified theory of time travel in Star Trek, and more recently, cataloging five of what I consider to be the biggest retcons in Star Trek. Links to all of those are in the description. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. And once again, big thanks to Star Trek Timelines for sponsoring this video. Download the game by clicking the link in the description, or by scanning the QR code to claim special rewards. I'll see you next week. Don't forget to be on time. Pun intended. Live long and prosper.